This is episode 132 of the XY podcast with Vanessa Stoikov. So a question we've been asking ourselves at XY quite a bit is how do we make financial advice irresistible? We know the value that comes from having a great advisor in your corner. So how are we articulating this as an industry to everyday Australians? Well, Vanessa Stoikov from Evolution Media is doing just this by blending her love for storytelling with a desire to educate people on the power of sound financial advice. And it's certainly making an impact. Her recent debut novel, The Breakfast Club for 40-somethings, and latest TV series, The Secrets of the Money Masters, are just two examples in her toolbox of strategies designed to highlight how important financial advice really is and ultimately encourage more people to engage a great advisor. So with that said, we hope you enjoy this episode. This podcast is brought to you by Salesforce, blaze new trails to richer client relationships with the world's number one CRM. Salesforce has designed the Financial Services Cloud to help you make every interaction personalized through rich client profiles centered on personal goals and pivotal life events. You can nurture deeper relationships with proactive tracking and event alerts that remind you to reach out when clients need you the most. Supercharge your productivity by managing client engagements, household relationships, and financial life goals all from the one connected platform. It's the world's number one CRM imagined just for wealth management. Salesforce is excited to partner with with XY Advisor to discuss how you can build richer client relationships and unlock loyalty. Well, Vanessa, welcome to the podcast for the second time. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. So what's, um, like it's been over a year, I think, since we, we talked last. Yeah, it's been well over a year, actually. Yeah. You've, um, you've sort of moved on from a couple of things, or not quite moved on, but um, I guess... Um, partner with people with what you've been doing over the last couple of years with mm. no more practice and yep. evolution media yeah yeah lots happened since we last spoke and it must be at least two and a half three years since we spoke i think you think so you yeah. must have been one of our first like oh yeah oh, it wasn't even really a podcast then it was like a webinar sort of yeah yeah and that's why i was this huge floating head on screen because i think i was doing it from home unguided so <laughs> this is slightly more professional but yeah lots happened since then so it's been good it's been incredibly busy but um I really hate it when people say they're busy because everyone's busy. So um, it's been very fortunate. I'm grateful, actually, for all that's happened. That's awesome. So is there anything that, like, over the last couple of years that was, like, really stands out since uh, – what, what do you feel proud of the most over the last couple well, of years? Well, two big things. One is that I launched my debut novel, The Breakfast Club for 40-somethings, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, is my greatest passion. Writing is the thing I love the most of all the media I create and all the stories I tell. I love to write. Um, And that was a really good learning experience. So, you know, I got distribution in Kmart and all across Australia and, you know, walked past the airport bookshops and saw my billboards out there. And that was um, that was May last year. And that was quite a surreal experience and a good learning. Was that the first with like a more of a retail audience? Or? Correct. Yeah. It was. It was. So Wiley's published it for me and it ended up in the top 10 money books last year for 2018 so that was good but look I learned a lot about consumers and how people consume books and Mm. you know I wrote a fiction book about money and writing fiction stories and having financial planning and advice lessons and investing lessons in there is not something that people go of course that's totally logical but I think the book connected with a lot of people that would never have heard that message anyway and I get a kick out of that people stopping going oh my god I read this I'm exactly like Jane or I'm so much like one of the characters in the book yeah, and that was cool so that was a big deal that's like I guess the the difference between like a communicating to the business community versus like the it's different it's yeah. so different yeah and, and I'm very comfortable in that B2B space because I've been in B2B since I was 21 years old and I'm 46 this year so quite some time but it forced me out of my comfort zone and I loved it. So I will write more in the future, although I have to say it's a very, very big task. So everyone's like, when's your next one coming out? I'm like, not for a while, but I do have a new baby coming out, which I can tell you about soon and not a real baby, thank God. I was going to say. Um, <laughs> I've already got three. I, I've done my job. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, I have three sons. Um, and yes, they are very good. I love them dearly, but no more. Um the other thing I did was sell one of my businesses, No More Practice, to OneView, um, mm. a listed company in the, in the fintech space. Yeah, Connie and the team. Connie yeah. McKeish, yes. Yeah. And that's been a great experience. I a mean, long time I, ago, I actually worked for Connie. Did you? In the early days of OneView. It was one of, really? Yeah, it's probably like, well, eight 
Oh, it'd be 10 years ago now. Okay, well, and I don't need to tell you anything about Connie that you won't know. But look, she's a woman with a vision. She is. And I am attracted to leaders with a vision. So to have my business purchased by One View was a great step forward for us because Evolution Media got the contract, which is my production business, to do all the content for normal mm. practice still. So we're still making the flagship TV show. I'm the editorial director, then I write every week for the website, um, and we make ongoing training for advisors. And the content's what I'm passionate about. Mm. I'm not crazy about running a business, to be honest. i have probably not all that good at it, really, because I don't really like managing people. <laughs> I just want to get on and tell the stories. That's the so, challenge you did, I'd say. Yeah, yeah well, um, it's a good fit. So there's a lot of resources at One View, um, and my head of the business went over to run that business there, Marcus Field, and so yep. there's a lot of continuity there. Um, so that business is going from strength to strength, and there's some exciting things happening that I'll be really thrilled to share with you and your audience as it comes out. Yeah, awesome. Well, it's the, with all so much change and um, challenge going on in the industry, it's a perfect for for the right um, businesses to provide more value and help um, through this sort of journey that everyone's going through. Yeah, probably. well, I think you're right there. The word is help, isn't it? Mm. Um, and I've been the Pollyanna of the industry for a long time. I see the good in most things. That's mm. my personality. But I absolutely believe in the power of financial advice. I always have. I'm quite a champion of advisors. I have an advisor who has given me certainty and I think most people in life need certainty with their financials and that's what an advisor can do. So um, I've made a lot of content around the great things advisors do. Um, we've got a new show coming out on the mm-hmm. Money Channel, yep. and I'll be hosting it. Yeah, nice. Um, and the great thing about this is that's a panel show, but we've wrapped our reality TV format around the panel. So okay. we're actually money-making over five celebrity athletes. Okay. So we've got Michael Klim, the swimmer, Bernard Foley, the wallaby, uh, Jude Bolton, ex-Swans player, Mac- um, the Matildas soccer star, Kaya Simon, and the Paralympian, who is just the most gorgeous girl, Madison de Rosario. So they all get assigned their own financial advisor. Awesome. And they go through a makeover experience where they learn about money, and then they get set with a money master, who are very high-end, high-quality fund managers, and they learn the secrets of managing money. So the show's called The Secrets of the Money Masters. Yeah. It's very commercial. It's, it's you know, we pride ourselves on edutainment and it is very entertaining mm. um, to see people who are elite athletes go through the experiences that all of us do with money. It's really good for the viewer because they say, wow, they're so good at this, but just like me, they don't have it all together. It's they more relatable. need help. They need a good team around them. Um, so we'll have a panel discussing those issues as you watch that on the screen. And I'll be having some amazing high-level C-suite guests sitting next to me talking about it. And yeah, great. it's a real sign um, from one view and from Connie that she wants to support the industry with these kind of very high-profile media vehicles. But also it's a real initiative. And I don't say fight back after Royal Commission, but I say talk back. Mm. because, you know, the Australian public's seen a lot of the worst of financial services, but now we need to show them the best. So, yes, there is a lot of repair to be done. There's been huge reputational damage done, but there are pockets of the industry like high-quality funds management, superannuation, um, and, you know, leading advisors that need a voice, and we'll be giving it that. So I'm very excited that's coming out, and it's all hands on deck now. It's pretty much 16-hour days to get it all happening. So nothing without hard work. It's a good initiative. What we talk about a lot with the guys at XY, so we're passionate about how do you, the idea of how do you make advice irresistible to the consumer? Because if you look at the the perspective that the common, um, the, the average Australian, they don't, they're not going, they're not waking out of bed going, I can't wait to have a financial advisor. So this sort of program. Weird. And, yeah, <laughs> It's, it's a lofty aspiration to sort of create that um, environment. I guess the way we go about it is, uh, I guess, facilitating advisors to improve how they do things and um, their footprint on their, their client base and their community, helping them improve that. But I guess some this sort of stuff is really important from, a, I guess, a media standpoint because, you, you, in a way, you're making financial planning sexy. Exactly. I've tried to make finance sexy my whole life and, honestly, <laughs> I... It's not feel better. Uh, still trying, so... <laughs> <laughs> but um, when you understand this industry, it is sexy. The brains in this industry have always fascinated me, far more than celebrity world. But I've found a winning formula in combining celebrities 
and well-known identities with this industry. Mm. It's it's a good mix. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, and it gives people the opportunity to come into a world they wouldn't otherwise feel like they have permission or interest to enter. Absolutely. You're talking about the book that you wrote before and, and the, the I guess, the different type of audience and how to talk to them. And by the sounds of it, you went down a path of, like, narratives that people can relate to, I guess. What are some of the key insights out of that journey and what you've seen people resonate with when you've, I guess, had feedback? And um, what, what, have, what have they um, clued into? So for, for the advisors out there thinking, how do I communicate better to prospective clients, my existing clients? What are some, some of the key insights from that journey that you went through? Hmm. Look, I, I wrote characters that I pretty much knew a lot of people that were like that. So a lot of my friends were like, is that Karen about me? I'm like, no, no, but there's mixes of everyone um, that I know that a big group. So there was a couple who the husband worked in finance, earned quite a big income. The wife stayed home, three kids, big mortgage, life expenses, big salary, but no real plan for the future. Just know well, it's all so busy now. And yeah. there was the divorce mum who, you know, was working part time and juggling kids, and her parents were looking after them. And, you know, they had to plan on how her parents could start to hand down some wealth to her yep. so that she'd be okay. And oh, there was a token billionaire just because I wanted him in there and he was hot. <laughs> and. <laughs> Everyone who wants to read the book is like, I like Brad. I'm like, everybody likes Brad, so by, right? So by the He's like it, Fifty the, Shades of Grey guy. So, so the audience was a female audience? Is oh, look, Ben read it. And a lot of the men that read it actually really liked it. They like Brad as well, did they? Well, <laughs> funnily enough, one of my favourite people that I've interviewed of all time, um, who is a philanthropist now of many, many billions of dollars, a global fund manager, wrote to me and he's 80 and said, Vanessa, this is the first book I've read cover to cover in years. Now, keep in mind, he's probably read The Economist every day of his life for 50 years. So my book was like, what? He probably never read anything like it. But it was the greatest compliment to me because this is a highly, highly intelligent man who understood for the first time why financial advisors were so important in people's life journeys. Mm. He just said, I just hadn't realized that as a fund manager, it's not what I thought about. So that was a big compliment to me. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I learned that people identified with people's situations. Mm. And I knew that would be the case because we do that now. You look at people like you or that you'd like to be like or that you don't want to become and sort of model yourself on that. Um, and that was powerful. You know, I had some people criticise and say there's nothing technical in here or, you know, you're not teaching me any concepts. And I'm like, but you know what? There's so many books out there that are That's technical the books stuff. on. That's all you can there. find it. Anything yeah. you want to know, sort of- yeah, you can find. Mm. But for those who wanted to be taken on a journey, and I guess the biggest thing I wanted people to understand is you need to start thinking about your retirement now. Mm. Like I've been banging on about this Generation X is doomed for quite some time now, but I have this fear. It's my nightmare that I wake up in 30 years and all my friends who are creatives, own restaurants, painters, all the people who don't earn a squillion dollars and all work in finance and understand the concepts will have a life where they can't leave home, they can't turn on the heating, they can't eat well because the pension won't be available then. And mm. no one seems to understand the concept, but there mm. won't be enough taxpayers. Yep. The way our population's dwindling, our way we're all living longer. We're supposed to be dead at 70, the pension's 65, and now we're all living into our 90s. So how are we funding this the last 20, 25 liability. years? And I just need people to wake up to that fact and start Mm. preparing. And so I feel like that's my life's purpose, to be honest, Mm. which kind of sucks because it's like a 30-year mission and it's like not good news, but... uh, (laughs) How do I communicate the bad news better? Yeah, 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 doom, doom. (laughs) But if people get it, um, then I'll feel like I've made a difference. you know. And even a few people getting it is better than none. Well, if that's the trigger for them, like the, the gentleman you're talking about, to go engage potentially... With an advisor, if they hadn't thought about it before, that's the... That's it. Oh, okay, I need to get advice. Like, And the guy that, you know, they all go to a party, the premises, all these characters go to their high school reunion, five of them, and they all sit around, tink, drink tequila and, you know, cut loose a bit, and then the truth comes out that their lives stink and most of it's to do with money, even though their lives look great on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. And so one of the gang happens to be a financial planner and he starts to talk about you. What's your problem? What's your problem? And starts to diagnose them, Dr. Phil style, and yeah. they all start to realise, oh, my God. Um, but through that and through the narration of having a financial planner as the hero, um, they start to solve their problems. And it also shows that you can't – it's not like, hey, lose weight in six weeks type thing. It was a 20-year journey, mm. but – the book at the end flashes forward to when they're all 70 and well, you can see what happens 
Well, that's the challenge, bring, bring that long, far-sighted destination, trying to bring it in front of people so it's right in front of them and they yeah. can get it now. Yeah, because everyone thinks, oh, it'll work out. Mm. Like, I don't want to think about then. I've got to deal with it now. It's time to sort it out. Yeah. So anyway, that's the hope. I enjoyed writing it. I will write many more in the future. But the TV show is my baby this year, and there's sort of a show about the show and the show. So um, that's this year's exercise in storytelling. And I think, you know, I think we'll connect with a lot of people with it because Australians love sport. That's why we pick sporting stars. Yeah, totally. Mm. So the, so the, I guess for the guys out there and, and girls, uh, anyone that's a financial advisor or aspiring to be a financial advisor, um, get the story of your clients clear. Is that sort of... Yeah, and be? look, engage in their story. And, and I know most financial planners do this, but understand what their dreams are. Mm. Because when you can feed people back their dreams and tell them how to get it, people usually follow a plan. Mm. So you see these athletes, like, the, you know, you can see it on screen, that penny-dropping moment when there's an advisor saying, if you put $1,650 away every month, by the time you're 55, you can early retire to these millennial athletes. And they're like, oh, yeah, I can do that. And then they're like, just give me a plan and I'll do it. I just need to be told what to do. And I think that's the power of advice. Understand their dream, give them the plan to do it, and just keep reminding them to stick to the plan. Just be there. It doesn't take much to be a touch point. Are you doing this? Texting, whatever. I think you guys have cottoned on to using technology to communicate, and I think that's the answer. An advisor's business where it's face-to-face and meetings all the time, it's not sustainable anymore. The business model isn't there. It's too costly, yeah. It is. And I know a lot of people who are now just what focusing on clients of $5 million up hmm. because that's how they can make money. Now, I have no judgment around that because I understand the need to make money. I need to make money for my family too. But there's a huge gap for Australians then who won't get advice unless savvy advisors say, I'm going to talk to you through technology, I'm going to be texting you, I'm going to be FaceTiming you, Zooming you, reminding you via an email, and you might not see me more than once every five years face-to-face, but you'll hear from me a lot. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of advisors, that, that's, the, that's the, I guess, the easier reaction to to not have to change a business model, to not have to innovate, to just, okay, well, let's just charge more and move up the food chain, so to speak, in terms of people's affor- affordability for advice. But the tar- being able to, that whole chasm that starts to open up, I think like the UK is one of the perfect examples that advice just went to where we're talking about, to that elite sort of status mm. and people with lots of money. But when they had their changes that came through the industry and caused the cost of advice to go up. So I think that's... Like I'm, I'm super passionate about helping advisors understand how they can tweak things to to keep their keep those clients, the everyday sort of Australian, as their clients because it's, um, yeah, it's 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 a, I think it's it's one of I guess the key underten- unintended com- uh, consequences of all the change that's washing through. Oh, you're spot on. I wrote a blog this week on the No More Practice website called "The Real Cost of Advisors Under Attack." And when you read the stats, it's that one in three Australians have no more than a month's salary saved up. One in three. So all you need is for a car to break down or to get sick or your washing machine and fridge to blow up or something and that month's savings is gone and you're in real financial peril. And the stats around people's mental health issues as money became a bigger issue, this is not a country that will be great to live in if a lot of people are under such stress, anxiety and mental health issues. And you saw the reaction. Like, I was fascinated by the reaction of the Royal Commission to the banks. And there was a day when it came out about NAB. And remember, everyone was really angry about that. And I got into a cab and this guy was just saying, oh, these wankers are just ripping us off. And he was so angry. And I said, oh, how have you been ripped off by the banks? I just have. How? They're just ripping us all off. But he had not personally had anything to do with it or in any way affected. But the rage and the the outrage, you know, and the media, general media love to create outrage. It's why people read headlines. It's why people read newspapers. Mm. Outrage sells. But when you've got a public that is outraged at the largesse and the greed of an industry, very hard to say on the other side, he's actually a small business person, an Mm. advisor who's running a small business Mm. whose purpose is to help you get your finances in order. And, you know, they're just two very different things than a head of a bank earning X million dollars to an advisor who, you know, good advisors' practices turn over half a million dollars. Like, that's not a large amount of money for a business. Yeah, so they're not people going don't out seem there. to understand they're living at large driving the Lamborghini, you know. No. So there's a big 
difference. Um, and, you know, we've all just got to keep trying to get through. What do you think with the changes that have come through? So in terms of, like, you look at the mortgage industry and the, the groundswell of reaction that came out of, that's the only actual sort of overturn so far of a certain So channel. right, yeah. So, like, I've been, I've, I've talked to a few guys and pondering how, how is that clarity and that message and the simplicity of what they're able to achieve in terms of talking to the politicians, getting everyone on board, I guess a lot of um, campaigning across the board because it did affect their business so f- like fundamentally. Is there any key messages that you think, because being in media, you, you're pretty good at this sort of stuff, that you think advisors could really sort of clue on to because there's so much stuff going on that none of this stuff cuts through because there's so much to talk about. So this 70 plus um, sort of uh, recommendations, um, not all of them apply to financial advisors, but even if you just look at that subset that actually directly impact financial advisors, there's too much to talk about if you want to have a clear message that goes through. So if you were, if you were sort of, well, I guess, helping advisors to communicate with the broader community, maybe politicians, what do you think is a good story for us to jump onto um, and to help communicate clearly to get um, to sort of mitigate some of these unintended consequences because you, you can't roll back any of this um, like all of this activity no, you can't erase the activity that's for sure and you can't erase the lack of trust that's mm. been created in the market but there are key components in people's lives and as we all get older that advisors can trigger onto that are emotional talking points now the mortgage industry did a great job and, and I've got a good friend Tanya Sale that runs an independent aggregator and they are you know she's she's a great lady actually I like her a lot and she worked pretty tirelessly to defend mortgage brokers when that came out but the reality is people want houses they feel like mortgage brokers get them a better deal and save them from just being screwed over by a bank so punishing a mortgage broker and taking away their livelihood when they were helping them Mm. was met with outrage because no one just wants to go direct to a bank well the whole intent was bank bashing i guess for the the foundation of the royal commission yeah exactly so you know that sort of backfired a bit but Mm. helped people go no not the poor mortgage broker like they're helping us don't punish them but it's interesting that they didn't perceive that the financial advisor was helping them too you know and anyone who's got a parent in aged care and my dad died last year and i watched him go into aged care for the last three weeks of his life and anyone who's assisted at those very emotional times in your life by financial advice would stand up and go don't punish those people they're Mm. helpers and I think advisors need to key on to the times where they've stood there whether it's insurance claims when people have died or there's trauma and we do work with AIA and I'm constantly blown away we film a lot of the stories of the Mm. claimants by the impact insurance has on people's lives when they have it Mm -hmm. and equally the impact when they don't because it's life destroying so if there's moments where an advisor can say, this is where I've helped, those are the stories that we need to get out there more so people understand that the advisors are the champion of the people. The fact that mortgage brokers were defended is because everyone loves property in this country and everyone mm. wants a mortgage or needs a mortgage. Mm. It's so a very simple they're sort of environment. It is. It's the same thing over and over, though. Property, property, property. And even in our show that we've shot, a lot of them either want a property, wish they'd had one, or want to spend more on their property, mm. you know. That's the Australian psyche. And we actually had some global fund managers come in who were like, it's not like this in Europe. Like, everyone's yeah. glad they didn't buy a property. In we don't places. have this continual upward spiral yeah. of price prices. Well, that's going to end. Yeah, you know, I think the love will start to dissipate a little bit. Exactly. So um, it doesn't mean people still don't want to own their own home, though. That will mm. always be something people want because that equals security. Mm. And if you look at that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, security and certainty is right up there for human beings. So how do advisors tap into being part of that solution? Yeah, so that's the challenge that we're not directly associated with because the proposition's maybe a bit broader. It is broader. It's... And like the specialists in estate planning, the specialists in insurance, mm. like there isn't like so the hard broker to get a handle on property. Like it is hard. But I think you've got to hang on to what your story is and try and get it out there with the local paper, host breakfast. I see a lot of advisors now doing just client functions themselves mm. and even, I saw one the other day doing one around the kitchen table, their own kitchen table, and inviting 10 women in to talk. And they all, you know, they he personally cooked for them and stuff. And I thought, oh, you know, like, it doesn't cost much to do that. 
But there's got to be innovative ways to bring people together and start a fan base because 10 people saying, wow, my advisor's amazing, equals 30 people hearing mm. that. If so more shit, there's 50 people hearing it. So, you know, we you need to be grassroots getting people to be advocates. So do you think maybe there's been, a, in terms of the ratios you're talking about there, there's been not enough advocates created to mitigate the... Um, the detractors that have been created. Yeah, I agree. I think that's true. But it's also, you know, people are more likely to talk about a bad experience than a good. Mm. That's just human nature too. So you need a lot more good experiences Correct. to trump that. you do. And you need to say to your clients, tell people. If you loved it, tell people so I can help more people. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with asking that. It's not saying recommend me in my business because that's kind of awkward and Australians aren't really into selling. But to say tell people about the good experiences, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I... I I think what you're doing with the TV show and what advisors can do on the ground, that's, that's a start. It's sort of... Uh, it's all giving it a crack. Keep <laughs> showing up. My father taught me never give up. So I just keep on going. I think, I think there, yeah. Where there's, where there's a will, there's a way. Eventually. There is. I think the industry will be a very different one in 20 years. What I find interesting, um, you know, and I started as a journo when I was 21. My first job was Investor Weekly magazine is how much uncertainty is in the industry at the moment about where the model's going. I mean, before the banks were disrupted and divesting of wealth arms, it was pretty much said how it was going to play out and what platforms would win and where advisors would go. And now a lot of that's up for grabs. Yeah. Um, and I find it exciting, actually, to be aligned with businesses like OneView, who are kind of contender business, who never charge shelf space fees, who are trying to aggregate a gateway so people can get low, lower cost to quality investing. I mean, there's a real opportunity for challenger businesses to rise now. Well, that, that sort of model is the, I guess, the, the regulatory environment is definitely pushing everyone towards that, um, I guess, the values that espouse that sort of model. Yeah. So, so that's exciting. Yeah. It is. That's exciting. So, you know, there's a bit of fear. Well, there's a lot of fear. People have to protect their own livelihoods, and that I understand. And when you have a mortgage and children in school and all the things that you've got to keep paying for, that's where a lot of the fear in the industry is coming from. Of mm. What about me? And I get that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's human nature too. Yeah, I think the, the, the fear, like there's obviously there's a number of different things going on in terms of impacts. One's a huge commission hit for a lot of advisors from an insurance standpoint. Um, and in in that respect, it's sort of how a lot of them aren't sure how to migrate to a fee for service model. Um, they they they've got a fundamental belief that that's not possible. Uh, it's it's a real challenging time when you've got such a fundamental belief that people won't uh, won't buy and sh- won't um, consume your service if they don't. It's not funded by commissions. Uh, I think a lot of people in the XY advisor group have shown that that's not necessarily the case. But that belief of inside an advisor's mind can be so strong that it's hard to, to adapt and, and change in terms of to different models. Yeah, look, and some won't make it because, yeah. you know, belief is 90% of success. If you can believe it can be done and have a vision, it's going to be hard and there'll be a lot of work and your, your revenues will be lumpy and cash flow will be, you know, it'll be stressful. And stress is not something people want to go, hey, give me more of, but those who ride through that and see a way through will make it. But I do believe an advisor needs to be more like a coach and mm. more like a trusted friend who's on your side. Um, and I actually think retainers are the way to go. I pay my advisor a retainer every month and mm. I never quibble that 200 bucks a mm. month going out. Like some months I don't hear from them and other months I'm sure they're like, oh, please go away. Um, and But no one yeah, ever says you owe me more, you know, at the end of it. So, you know, advisors have got to get to the point where people go, yeah, it's just like a gym or whatever else I'm paying for. It's one of those necessary costs. Yeah, I think the the challenge with um, – you've got, you've got other professions that sort of – particularly accounting, they're trying to gravitate towards – this sort of charging model that advisors have traditionally had, which is the um, ongoing retainer model, um, they they want to they're going ASICs. They're sort of ideally going. You you pay for like people pay for the time that you spend with them, but I guess from a, if we go back to uh, what you're talking about with um, the value of advice and that certainty that's created, 
this charging structure is all part of that. That's it's it's about sort of that steadiness, that reliability. That this is I pay this, I've got that certainty that that person's there. And I think there's there's that challenge around a lot of uh, stakeholders um, that are contributing to what's going on in the industry, not quite understanding that intangible element of what you're talking about. That you're able to go away, not use a service for, or not not engage with your advisor, but actually have comfort when you're doing that that it's there. Mm. And that sort of um, that dynamic, I think, I, I, I really feel that they don't fully get it, and um, that's one of the biggest challenges in terms of, I guess, what they're uh, the pressure that they're putting on um, ongoing service. And sometimes I think when people doubt what they're adding, it's for good reason. If you don't think people want to pay for you and that you're not worth it, maybe you need to assess what value you're adding. Because if you truly believe you add value, you will find a way to make people pay for that. Mm. Yeah. That's fair. You will. That's and that sounds call. simplistic, but there's a lot of people, even when I've employed so many people over 20 years now running a business, and the ones that always were worried about their job security were the people that weren't adding enough value. Mm. The people that are secure in their jobs, they know they're indispensable. Mm. So, or secure in their ability to get another job maybe as well. <laughs> yeah, probably. That's a millennial thing, but hey, that's a whole other topic. But you know what I mean. Even if a business is doing it tough, if you're someone that's so indispensable to that business and adds so much value, you got to think, I'll be the last to go. Mm. Whereas the people who are all like, oh, my God, what about me? It's like, well, what value are you adding? And maybe I'm being too black and white, but... I think the same with advisors. If you know you add value and that you are good at what you do, you will find a way. Yeah. I, yeah. Except if I, you're of an age where you're like, you know what, this is all too hard. And that is a very different circumstance. Well, I agree. I, I definitely agree with what you're saying. I think, I think one of the things that's really challenging is that being, I think, the constant barrage of advisors aren't good the value that's provided isn't isn't up to scratch it's i think that constant barrage and messaging that advisors are receiving yeah that's even deep. some of the guys that um mostly guys because like it's it's the ones that have been around for a while that are sort of really bearing this they're like i've been doing this for like 10 15 years and they're sitting there going i think i think I, what i do is valuable and starting to question what they're what they're doing because they're being told that this is the only way that um, advice can be done to some extent in terms of depending on like ASICs coming through and going, oh, this is what it has to look like or um, it, things are getting more prescriptive in some of the dealer groups. And you're saying clients don't value that bit, they value this bit. And there's that disconnect and they go, that confusion and uncertainty, I think, oh, is it's, really I mean, hitting that the is, confidence. It is, it is. And you're right about that. Being told you're rubbish 24-7 is not great for your psychological ability to think you're awesome. Um, and there will be, I mean, 300, I read a report two days ago that 300 advisors left the industry last month alone. Mm. So there is a mass shedding of people who've just gone, nah, can't do it, not for me, too hard. And I do feel for the amount of compliance that has to be done because that is so boring. Like, honestly, like it's, ridiculous amounts of compliance. Yeah, especially at the institutional licensee level. Just, yeah, it's I very can't tough even imagine. There. I it's, can't even imagine. So I do feel for that. But there has to be a way because Australians desperately need it. So my job is to go out and tell people how life-changing and transformational it is. I can't do anything to help on the compliance side. God knows I'd be a liability. But, um, you know, <laughs> you others have there. to do that. You really that. don't want to go Others there. have to do that, you know, because we have to break through because it's too important. I've got three children and I don't want my sons growing up in a place where there's this whole generation of elderly people who are institutionalised mm. or euthanised because there's no other solution. And I'm telling you, in 30 years, it will be a very different place unless we start to solve this now. And it's a real problem because we don't have politicians who are visionary. Mm. You know, if you look at all the decisions that were made by the Whitlam government for free education and superannuation, you know, legislated, and a lot of those are Labor decisions and we're looking at a new government, but how many politicians do you see talking about the 20 and 30 year future of Australia? It's issues based. It's minute to minute. It's poll based. It's popularity based. What's and who's going to stab you saying? in the What's party the... behind you? And I think the lack of visionary leadership in politics has left people thinking, "Where are we going?" It so, doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't lend itself to this long term challenge. That you're well, talking hopefully about. we can 
find that in the business community. Very hard to find in the banks when they're looking at share price. Let's be honest, the shareholders want their money. Mm. So you can't run a business with a 20-year outlook when you're paying quarterly shareholder dividends or, you know, reporting that often. Yeah. So it has to come from private enterprise. It has to come from incredibly wealthy people who don't have anything to lose. Mm. You know, there's a lot of leadership we need that won't come from politics in the future. Yeah, I'm thinking there's maybe a message in there around um, that unfunded liability and and in terms of the way advisors relate to the balance sheet of the taxpayer. Like, people don't like paying taxes. They're always, yeah, well, they they always think the, does? Nobody they always think the, um, the uh, politicians are wasting money. So maybe there's a bit of a messaging in there. Look, if we can get people to look beyond how tough it is today and tomorrow and the next holiday and things they want to where do you want to be in 20 years then advisors will have a much better chance at showing here's how I'll get you there and here's why you'll pay me what I'm worth. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, it's a great angle to take. So, Vanessa, is there anything else you'd like to share with uh, everyone that's listening around? Obviously, you've got the show coming up. Is there any anything else on the on the boil? And You said there might be another book. Oh, there might be, but not any time soon. But <laughs> One like, thing at a time. Yeah, I'm like, please, advisors, buy the book and give it to your clients because it makes you look good because the advisor is the, the hero there. So, you know, I do ask for people. I'm not very good at asking for a sale. I'm actually quite rubbish at it, but it's not to sell. I wrote it so that people could understand what advisors do. Hmm. Um, so, But I need a groundswell of advisors who believe in it enough. And I've had lots of great advisors who are buying 10, 20, 50, 100 I'll hand it out to their clients. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that's been really valuable. A lot of the super funds now are buying it for their members yeah, awesome. and getting out there. So if you're struggling with your client communications, you can. here's a shortcut. Just uh, grab Go Vanessa's get the book. book and say, this is why you need me. What's it Read called the again? Book, the, the Breakfast Club for 40-somethings. Breakfast Club for 40-somethings. Love have you it. seen the movie The Breakfast Club? I have, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, it's kind of loosely based around that, but they've all grown up. You know, and um, there's a very different set of, things in your 40s that you worry about than when you're at high school you know like you think it's all going to be easy and then you're like hang on that didn't turn out the way i planned yeah i can imagine i i, I don't know but i can imagine <laughs> yeah well one day my friend time waits for no one so um well thank you very much for having me i've enjoyed talking to you awesome Vanessa. thank you